Sir, please. You've lost too much blood. Calm yourself. You think I didn't notice? Stop your staring and get me to an hospital, you ass! Insulting a good Samaritan. Not exactly the way to get rescued. All right, all right, sorry. I am in pain here. My guts are spilling out onto the street and you're yabbering on. Yes. That's a very nasty wound you've got there. Take my word, I was... I am a doctor. Dr. Jonathan Reed. <sighs> Name's Clay Cox. I'd appreciate you helping me to a better place, Doc. Follow me, Mr. Cox. Let me assist you to that better place. Sometimes let his prey go, but no famished hunter can run for long. Good evening, nurse. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed, the new surgeon here at the Pembroke. Dr. Swansea has already told us about you, sir. I'm Nurse Gwyneth Brannigan. Welcome to the Pembroke Hospital. Did he really? It's a good thing I wasn't hoping to keep a low profile. All members of staff have already read about your new blood transfusion technique. Dr. Swansea made sure of that. I see. Well, I'm a little surprised. But I suppose I'll just have to deal with this unexpected notoriety. You must know, blood transfusions are Dr. Swansea's primary subject of research. He is convinced it is the future. How are things here? Not good, to say the least. We're struggling against an invisible enemy, more lethal than any bullet from a gun. It's hard, Doctor. An invisible enemy? Quite a poetic term for a disease, especially from a nurse. Sorry, Doctor. These last few weeks have been exhausting. We could all do with a good night's sleep. Do you think this hospital can survive the epidemic? We are all volunteers here, and we're trying to hold fast, but how do we beat an invisible killer? Some nurses have already resigned. I'm not familiar with all the staff yet. Perhaps you could help me. Brilliant professionals, most of them. 
Dr. Swansea has a gift for recruiting talent. Most of them. Is there a problem I should know about, nurse? It would be inappropriate for me to speak ill of a colleague. Is there anyone that stands out? Well, I have never met someone as dedicated as Dr. Tippett's. He should be a standard for us all here. If only he were younger. Why should his age be a problem? I guess it's fair to say he's always pushing himself to the limits. He just doesn't know when to stop and get some rest. Nurse Brannigan, if you do know something, please tell me. Anything you say will be held in confidence. No. I may disagree with some conduct, but in the end, everybody is doing their best. Goodbye, nurse. Call me if you need assistance. Doctor, where have you been? I've little time to play hide-and-seek with new staff members, no matter how illustrious they may be. I found a wounded man by the docks. He answers to the name of Clay Cox. He requires urgent medical attention. Already making the rounds? That's the Pembroke spirit. I'll ask our porter, Milton, to bring him back immediately. Thank you, nurse. What can I do for you? Dr. Swansea insisted we provide you a quiet office. You'll find it on the second floor with your name on the door. Thank you. Nurse Crane, isn't it? Yes, Dorothy Crane. Welcome to Pembroke Hospital, Dr. Reed. Your office has been prepared. I would like to ask a few questions first. And Mr. Hampton, the patient we brought in, how does he fare? I gave him a sedative to help him sleep. Poor thing was in quite a state of shock. What kind of man is Dr. Swansea? Well, you accepted the job from him. I thought you would have known about your employer. Apologies, I've only just met him the once. This is sudden. I've only just returned to England. Dr. Swansea is a brilliant surgeon and the most compassionate physician. It's right to assume Dr. Swansea knows far more about me than I do about him. You'll get to know him soon enough, and better than me. The administrator has better things to do than mix with us. If you could point me in the direction of my room again, nurse. Second floor of the hospital, left after the stairs. It's the last vacant office at the end of the corridor. Thank you, Nurse Crane. Good evening, sir. So it is true. The famous Dr. Reed has joined us. I can't think of any better news during these terrible times. Do we know each other? Actually, yes. We met once before at the Rockefeller University in New York. Dr. Tippett, yes, I remember. I was assisting Professor Carell in his research about coronary bypasses. He had nothing but praise for you. He was also very confident about your future. And look at you now. Eminent surgeon and blood transfusion specialist. What is the Pembroke Hospital situation? And please, speak freely. This hospital is not exactly the best of London. I'm sure you are used to working in a better environment. It's not exactly the best situation in London either. I can't have expected this hospital to be prepared for what was to come. Don't be misled by appearances, Dr. Reed. This hospital does not lack talented people. It just lacks hope. What can you tell me about the staff in the hospital? Some are really good, and others are not so good. But during this troubled period, there is no time for slander. 
I prefer to focus on the positive character traits. Any opinion about the management? I don't always agree with Dr. Swansea's reserve, but I must admit he does all he can to keep this facility running during this crisis. Ah yes, the burden of command. I was fed up with this concept while serving as a medical officer. Don't get me wrong, Swansea's a good administrator. I just wish he would get out of his office down again. Tell me more about cherished people then. Nurse Branigan is a pearl. She is the most helpful and dedicated nurse I've ever worked with. A clever and cheerful woman. You really seem to admire her skills. I'll go even further. If she was a man, she would be a damn fine practitioner. You're exhausting yourself, Corcoran. Maybe you should think about preserving your strength. No. We must keep on healing all those poor souls. We are the last rampart before chaos. Once more, unto the breach. Nurse Branigan is worried about you, Doctor. <laughs> she should not have told you that. I will have a word with her. You don't have to blame her for her honesty. <laughs> I'm not that kind of man, my dear Jonathan. Actually, Nurse Branigan's opinion is the only one I may listen to. Goodbye, Dr. Tippett. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. I'm new here. I've already heard about you, Dr. Reed. I'm Milton Hooks, the ambulance driver for this shithole of a hospital. That's quite a blunt introduction, Mr. Hooks. You can call me Milton. I like to speak my mind, Dr. Reed. Perk of the job. Don't judge me, and I won't judge you. I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about. Well, I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure a gun can't be used as a surgical instrument. You have a keen eye. I learned to shoot during the war, and have carried one ever since. Old habits die hard. No need to explain, Dr. Reed. And if you ever need a better gun, remember, I may have something for you. How is the situation around here? You want to hear the situation is all right? It's fucking awful. We lack everything, and it's getting worse every day. So what do you do exactly in this hospital? Apart from smuggling guns, I mean. I've been an ambulance driver since... too long, I guess. I bring sick people here night and day. It's a dirty job, but I get it done. Most of the time. Since you're on the front line, how is the sanitary situation in this vicinity? It's a complete disaster. It's even getting dangerous to enter some streets or buildings. Even the locals attack you. It sounds like things have been a bit rough recently. What's happened? Yesterday I got attacked by the patient I was bringing in. I escaped from the hospital's garden, but I lost my wallet when I was running. You left an infected patient outside the hospital. That's incredibly dangerous. Go there yourself if you want, but be careful, Doctor. I'd rather not bring your dead body back. Are you really smuggling weapons through the hospital? And why not? I've already been attacked by patients, you know. And by gang members willing to steal my money. But you're not defending yourself. You're selling guns to civilians. You keep people alive your own way, Doctor. I offer them another way to protect their health. I'd like to see your goods. Wise choice, Dr. Reed. A reliable gun is what everybody needs these days.
Good evening, Milton. Good evening, Doctor. Still trying to save lives. I'd like to see your goods. Wise choice, Dr. Reed. A reliable gun is what everybody needs these days. Perhaps I should have considered the offer from that Cadogan fellow. It is now on. Good evening, Nurse Brannigan. Good evening, Doctor. Why does Dr. Tippett's claim you're the main reason he keeps working, despite his fatigue? If it wasn't for him, I probably would have left the Pembroke years ago. Dr. Tippett's does not think of you as just a nurse anymore. Does he? If you're suggesting he's not taking my gender into consideration when it comes to medical practice and knowledge, I really hope he doesn't. Goodbye, nurse. Call me if you need assistance. Dr. Swansea is right. This place seems perfect to conduct my research. I cannot enter. Scowl voices in the garden. I should investigate. If they were to find somebody...
Good evening, Milton. Good evening, Doctor. Still trying to save lives. I have some good news, Milton. What? The epidemic's over? I retrieved your wallet. With all the money and a certain picture. Well, yeah. Pippa Hawkins is my girl. So what? Is it the difference of skin colour that bothers you? Not at all, Milton. Good. Please, take this money anyway. To remind you to keep your mouth shut. Not everybody is as broad-minded as you, Dr. Reed. What's going on between you and Nurse Hawkins? Pippa's tired. Tired of all this shit. Tired of all those corpses piling up. She's as depressed as I am. You do realize you could both get fired. Hospital staff are not meant to have intimate relationships with one another. Come on, Dr. Reed. Do you know how many rules are broken in this hospital every day just to keep it running? There's nothing wrong with what we're doing. During the war, I witnessed a few couples just like you come together in difficult circumstances. It can be very damaging. Maybe you're right. But we support each other. And that's all that matters. Goodbye, Milton. Good evening, nurse. Good evening, doctor. I don't think we've been introduced yet. My name is Pippa Hawkins. And I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. Dr. Swansea has recently offered me a position in this hospital. Well, it's a euphemism that your help will be appreciated, doctor. How would you describe the situation at the Pembroke Hospital? It's serious. The flu is wreaking havoc amongst the staff and patients. We are running out of everything. Nurse Hawkins, the Spanish flu won't last forever. Even the Black Plague didn't kill everyone. I wish I could believe you. But what if this epidemic was worse? What if in the end, nobody was spared? You must get a hold of yourself, Nurse. <sighs> Sorry, I'm exhausted. No one has any idea when this epidemic will be over. How long have you been a nurse? Well, long enough to see that the epidemic is winning. And no matter how qualified you are, don't tell me you'll change that. You're right. When dealing with such a terrible disease, one must remain humble. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try our best. <laughs> Sorry, Doctor. I don't want to sound bitter, but I'm just too tired to give a pep talk like Nurse Brannigan. How is the Pembroke staff coping with the epidemic? Well, not well. Milton, the ambulance driver, is even more grumpy than usual, especially concerning doctors. Why does Milton dislike doctors? Well, I don't know. Just ask him. But be warned, Milton is not the chatty type. Why is Milton grumpy on a daily basis? Is it just an act? Milton's not the kind of man who's bothered about a bad reputation, whether he deserved it or not. Pepper, I know you're very close to Milton Hooks. Yes, Milton Hooks is my man. If you want to report me for that, just feel free, Doctor. I have no intention of reporting you, Nurse Hawkins. But are you aware of the risks? The rules say I won't be allowed to work as a nurse anymore. But here at the Pembroke, we break rules all the time. Is he worth the risk? Hey, I'm no perfect woman, and Milton is not the finest bloke. But we do our best to get by. That's all any of us can hope for nowadays. Goodbye, Nurse Hawkins.
Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Reed. I believe we're going to be colleagues. Reed? Yes, I've been informed about your arrival. I'm Waverly Aykroyd. Welcome aboard, I suppose. Does my arrival inconvenience you in some way, Dr. Aykroyd? Let us just say that I don't particularly share Dr. Swans's enthusiasm for hiring you. What we need here are reliable professionals, not overrated dabblers. If you have a problem with me, Dr. Aykroyd, please feel free to tell me. Dr. Swansea has imposed your presence on this hospital without asking anyone's advice. The benefit of his position. But I don't agree with it. I know we've never met before, but I believe this hospital could use all the help it can get. You will agree with that, I'm sure. Oh, but I have heard about you, Dr. Reed. Of course you can't say the same about me, since I have not wasted my time courting the press. There is no need for such animosity between us. Don't you think the epidemic is already enough to deal with? That is one point we could agree on. And that is precisely why I want to be sure that you will be of help to this hospital instead of a burden. Since your tenure in this hospital is longer than mine, perhaps you can tell me more about this place. Let's just say I'm tired of the carelessness around me. I have always respected the skills of Dr. Swansea, but over time, his enthusiasm has become displaced. Carelessness? Exactly what are you talking about? We're here to save lives. The people who trust us are not volunteering for experimentation. They're here to be healed. I don't intend to run any radical experiments, Doctor. Even if I, as any good practitioner should, express an interest in pushing the boundaries of medical research. Modern medical methods were created through audacity and ego. But there are rules in our line of work, and they're here to protect our patients. I don't know what you've heard about me but I have already proved my value as a practitioner. I don't question your skills, Dr. Reed, but your motive. Is it money, fame, or are you truly dedicated? And what exactly is that supposed to mean? I served in the war just like you. But unlike you, I did not use the wounded to play the modern sorcerer. Be careful what you insinuate, Dr. Aykroyd. I only want you to admit you used those men to improve your theories. This is ridiculous. My blood transfusion technique saved many lives, and you know it. You see? That is exactly what I hate about people like you. You avoid this kind of accusation instead of facing reality. It seems you have bad memories of your military service. I refuse to see this industrial slaughter as scientific progress. War only reveals the worst in men. We can at least agree on something, Dr. Ackroyd. Thank you for your time. We'll talk later. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Reed. May I help you? I don't know if a third opinion is needed. Your colleagues are already arguing about my condition. I see. Would you mind telling me more about your situation? I'm Harvey Fiddick. All I want is to get me bloody arm fixed properly. Tell me about the doctors who are arguing about your case. Strickland and Aykroyd. They both want the best for me, but there's a lot of pride there. Doctors are no different from carpenters, it seems. What do you mean? I often had professional arguments with rivals on a building site. Difference is, I disagreed about wooden nails, not flesh and bones. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Fiddick. I'm just a regular guy waiting to get his arm fixed, so I can return to work and to my family. I was more curious about what you were doing before being hospitalized. I'm a carpenter, and a good one too. But that means I need both arms to feed my family, Dr. Reed. Are you satisfied with your treatment here? Well, 
It's clear that I've chosen a bad time to be injured. Forgive my bluntness, but you seem overwhelmed by cases of the flu. I won't lie to you about it. I'm afraid we are. Are you sure you don't want to operate yourself, Dr. Reed? I have the feeling you're very capable. And your colleagues seem to think so too. In other circumstances, you would be right. But for now, I don't think I can take on the responsibility. My apologies. Goodbye for now, Mr. Fiddick. I'll see you later. You always knew the words to calm the children, Helen. As for me, what a blundering idiot. Good evening, sir. Doctor. Good evening, madam. Can I help you? It's my son who needs you, sir. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. How can I help your son? I'm Beatrice Goswick, mother of Mortimer Goswick. Could you check on him, please, Dr. Reed? I've heard much of your talents as a physician. What can you tell me about yourself, Mrs. Goswick? Not much to say. Just take care of my Mortimer and I'll cover all the expenses. That's all that matters. May I ask if you have an occupation, Mrs. Goswick? I'm a teacher by profession. I teach young women who are more ambitious about their futures than their families. Are you really that rich? Most of the patients here are of a more humble origin, if I may say so. Yes, thanks to my husband. May he rest in peace. I can cover any needed medical expenses. What do you think of your reception here? Any complaints? I have had the uttermost reservations about this hospital since we arrived, but we had no other choice, considering the state of emergency. Is there something in particular that's bothering you? Some of the staff were not especially welcoming. I suspect they're not accustomed to dealing with patients of such social standing. Tell me more about your arrival at the Pembroke Hospital. What gave you such a bad first impression? The ambulance driver was quite rude, for a start. And that nurse, Miss Hawkins, seems to have quite a dubious attitude. What do you mean? She managed to secure a bed for my son despite the epidemic. It was a relief, but it wasn't cheap. She charged you for a bed? Yes, and I paid without question, considering the urgency of the situation. I share your concern, Mrs. Goswick. Be sure that I'll talk to the people involved. I don't expect compensation, Dr. Reed. But I'm aware such behavior would not be tolerated in other hospitals. I'm all right. Don't waste your time with me. Goodbye, Mrs. Goswick. Good evening. I'm Dr. Reed. Can I help at all? No. Really? Why are you here, then? I don't want to talk. My throat hurts too much. I suppose that this pain is the reason you're here. Is someone taking care of you? Yes. And no. Could you at least tell me your name, sir? Mortimer. Mortimer Goswick. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'm sure you realize a doctor and his patient have to communicate, sir. Would it help if I gave you some paper and a pen? Not really. I see. Then maybe it's not just your throat that hurts, Mr. Goswick. Perhaps your sore throat is just the consequence of something more hurtful. Yes, maybe. But I don't want to talk or even write about it now. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'll let you get some rest, then. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Goswick. How are you? I'm okay. Why did your mother have you hospitalized here? She seems convinced this is a bad hospital. My mother just wants the best for me. She won't rest while I'm here. She'd go all the way to hell and back to help me. Is your mother bothering you? As your doctor, I can ask her to leave you alone if you would prefer. That's tempting, doctor. 
But you have no idea what my mother is capable of. She would tie herself to my bed if you asked her to leave. Pembroke Hospital may look unorthodox, but rest assured, you're in good hands here. It's not me you have to convince, Dr. Reed. It's my mother. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Goswick. I don't want to talk, Doctor. I have to go now, sir. But don't hesitate to contact me if you need any help. I'm all right. Don't waste your time with me. Good evening, Doctor. I believe we're going to be working together. Dr. Reed. Dr. Swansea informed us of your arrival, but I could not dare to believe we'd have such good fortune. Such an honor, sir. <laughs> Thank you. And you are? I am Thoreau Strickland, Dr. Thoreau Strickland. I'm a great admirer of your work, Dr. Reed. Please, could you tell me something about yourself? I'm a great admirer of your work concerning blood transfusion, Dr. Reed. I run my own experiments. I'm convinced it's the future. I based my technique on my mentor's research. He helped me perfect my method. What is yours? I'd rather not talk about it. For now, it's just theories and first approach. My process is purely experimental and unsuccessful. As long as you're cautious and methodical, you may remain empty-handed, but you won't fail. You're not the first one to warn me. But I am convinced knowledge is the main weapon against the ravages of this epidemic. What made you choose to be a doctor? I'm not ashamed to admit you and your work have inspired me. I am honored to have the opportunity to work by your side. I'll give you some advice, but understand that nothing beats practical experience, which can be exhausting and solitary work. Of course, sir. And don't worry, I will never allow myself to be a burden, uh, neither to you nor this hospital. What can you tell me about the Pembroke? Well, it has always been an honor to work with Dr. Swansea. But with your arrival, I can't think of a better opportunity to learn about blood transfusion. Do you need help with anything in particular? Well, yes, maybe. I'm waiting for a batch of products I ordered for my personal research, yet my supplier seems to have vanished. Do you want me to play the errand boy for you? Oh no, Dr. Reed. But if you went personally to his shop, what with your reputation and all, he wouldn't dare to refuse the products I need. I see. Well, give me the address, for I may pass by if I have time. You seem quite optimistic. It's a rare and precious attitude in these difficult times. I'm convinced that this epidemic is a test. A test of endurance and dedication for us men of science. Questions remain about our capacity to resolve the situation. True, true. Last summer, during the first wave of the epidemic, I used to joke with Milton about the extra work. We're not smiling now. What do you think of Dr. Ackroyd's aversion to modern medical methods? It's a shame he's so narrow-minded. Dr. Swansea taught me that science is about exploring uncharted territory. I'm convinced that's true. With the influenza and all that's going on, you should put your differences aside, don't you think? Why is it so difficult to work together? I believe that if Dr. Ackroyd had been the one to discover the transfusion process, he would be the first to recommend its use. So you believe it's just a question of jealousy and pride? Dr. Ackroyd is as proud as he is blinded by his obsolete concept of medical science. Tell me more about your willingness to experiment with new medical techniques. Harvey Fiddick is a patient suffering from a severe injury that could cripple him if not treated correctly. I'm convinced your blood transfusion technique could help him. What is it you really want? To save him or to prove your point? Fair question. I want nothing but to save my patient, Dr. Reed. Especially since I know Mr. Fiddick's story. 
Tell me Mr. Fiddick's story. Our first diagnosis was compromised because Mr. Fiddick lied to us about the real origin of his injury. He first claimed it was an accident. But why would he hide such crucial information from us? Because he is a proud father, ashamed of putting his children at risk because of his own negligence. This personal involvement could also appear to be a lack of impartiality. You must know that a good surgeon must remain neutral. I agree. But that does not excuse Dr. Ackroyd's behavior. A man who did not even take time to converse with his patient. Do you think keeping his distance was a mistake? All I know is that I'm taking care of human beings with desires, hopes, and fears. Not some biological machine comprised of blood, bones, and flesh. Goodbye, Dr. Strickland. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Unless you're here to fix my face, no. I don't think you can help me. I'm Dr. Reed. I've recently taken the position of head surgeon here. War injuries, am I right? You guessed right, Doctor. German shell took my pretty little mug right off. But they still call me Thomas Elwood. How is your stay with us, Mr. Elwood? Oh, it's bliss. I just escaped death in the trenches to be surrounded again by the moans of the dying. Can I ask you precisely why you're a patient here? It's the pain, sir. The drugs don't work. It just hurts under the scars, if you get my drift. Who is treating you? Is someone in particular looking after your case? Nobody since the old and tired doctor spoke to me. Started to think I was forgotten about. Wouldn't blame you. You don't seem worried by that. My face hurts so much more when I smile or cry. I've learned it's easier not to speak. But be assured I'm smiling inside. Can I do anything for your pain? Nurses gave me a bunch of pills. No effect. Told you. It's like the flames are under my skin, burning away. Where were you stationed, sir? Did you serve for long? I really don't want to talk about all this shit. No offense. I was pushing too much. I served in France myself. I just wanted to know what happened to you. You were an officer, weren't you? Then I doubt we fought the same war, sir. No offense. Goodbye for now, Mr. Elwood. Good evening, Mr. Hampton. How do you feel? Dr. Reed, is it? Oh, sir, I must apologize for my behavior. What do you mean? I was not myself in the factory. Fear and exhaustion made me say awful things to you, I'm afraid. You remained perfectly nice and polite. A little delirious, perhaps. But who wouldn't be after enduring an abduction? Thank you, Doctor. That's a relief. Now all I need to do is rest and return to my flock. How did you end up in William Bishop's den? I had received alarming news about his recent behavior. I went to his place and he refused to let me go. Why did he abduct you? William was an alcoholic. His addiction suddenly changed to blood. I don't know why. Just like a patient I met here, this Miss Hawcroft. You dared to enter this awful place alone. You're a hero, Mr. Hampton. Or a fool. I'm just a man trying to help his friends, Dr. Reed. William Bishop was a conflicted soul, searching for light. Do you know Tom Watts, the bartender from the Turtle? I met him before I found you in the canning factory. Tom? Yes, of course. Always the helping hand, good old Tom. 
Without men like him, corruption and despair would have wiped out the East End long ago. People are still in despair. How could it be otherwise? The authorities have left us all to rot in this contagious nightmare. No drugs, no advice, nothing. It's a damn shame. Who should I avoid in this part of town, then? Any particularly evil figures? Not really. Most men and women are just doing their best. And it's not my habit to speak ill of people I know, Doctor. What is the general situation in the East End docks? The situation has always been tough, with a lot of tensions between the gangs and the Dockers' trade union. The wet boot boys are very nervous since they lost their leader. Who leads the gang now? Since Clay Cox went missing, it's his wife Edwina who runs the show, with the assistance of her minion, Booth Digby. Has the gang been threatening you? Ah, no. I have had this nickname for so long, you know, the sad saint of the East End. No one dares to book a saint, not even criminals. What do you do for a living, Mr. Hampton? I can't help but notice the cross around your neck. I manage a night asylum for the poor and homeless of the docks, and I try to guide the lost and hesitant on the right path to our Lord. Are you a priest, Mr. Hampton? A deacon, maybe? Not at all, Doctor. I'm just a man of faith willing to preach the good word. Why didn't you use your cross against William Bishop? To repel him somehow? That's a very strange question, Doctor. A cross is no magical token, if that's what you were trying to say. Not mine, anyway. Have you made friends since you arrived? Not really. But I recognize Miss Harriet Jones. I knew her when she lived by the docks. That poor woman had such a miserable life. You never came to see her here at Pembroke. Receiving visits when sick can be an important part of the healing process, you know. We're not just bodies. You're preaching to the converted now, Doctor. To be truly honest, I thought she was dead. She left the docks many months ago. How do you feel, Mr. Hampton? Medically speaking, I mean. I feel exhausted. Beyond exhaustion, actually. William drank so much of my blood in his madness. I feel... empty. You're in good hands here. Dr. Swansea is well versed in blood transfusion, and I'm sure he'll take the best care of you. Thank you, sir. I believe all I need is rest, and then I can go back to the people who need me. Goodbye, Mr. Hampton. We'll talk again later. Good evening, miss. I'm Dr. Reed, the new surgeon at the Pembroke Hospital. And who are you? Your name has no meaning to me, mortal. You're nothing but dust blown by the winds of eternity. I beg your pardon? What are you begging for, mortal? My clemency? Well, tonight maybe I'm inclined to mercy. You'll never forget the night you met Thelma Howcroft. You keep calling me mortal. Why is that? And if I'm mortal, what are you? Well, Dr. Reed, if you must know, I'm a vampire. And why do you believe you're a vampire? I don't need to believe anything. It is what I am. It is what I feel within this hollow shell of flesh. Please, describe to me how you feel. What is it like to be a vampire? I can hear my body crumble from the inside as my flesh cracks and fades. I sense the last pulse of postulant blood within my drying veins. I need new blood. I see. Have you ever heard of Cotard syndrome, Miss Howcroft? Never. It's a mental illness discovered by a French neurologist named Jules Cotard. The affected patients are delusional. They believe that they are putrefying, that they are dead, a, a ghost or a ghoul, or in your case, a vampire. Delusional, you say? Oh, sad and petty mortal. 
You can't even begin to understand the concept of immortality. And you think it is I who am delusional. I'm assuming you must be a patient here. Am I right, Miss Howard? It's only a cover. To hide from my enemies. I can leave whenever I want. As a woman, a, a spirit, fog, or bat. Who are these enemies you mentioned? Can you describe them? I cannot say for sure. But I sense their eyes on me from nearby. I, I, I feel them watching me every time I visit the garden near the morgue. The staff here are not your enemy. They're here to help you, to care for you. I'm not speaking of the doctors in white. I'm speaking of the men and women who hunt me, for I am a vampire. I see. Don't worry. These people will not find you here. I'll personally make sure they leave you alone. Thank you, mortal. But do not interfere with them, for you are no match for those that hunt me. Who are you really, Miss Howcroft? I mean, apart from being a vampire. Is that not enough for you, puny mortal? What do you require? Hmm? Proof of my powers? I'm curious to know who you were before becoming a vampire. No, it was such a long time ago, I don't remember. Centuries of unholy life can have strange effects on one's minds, you see? I'll leave you, Mistress of the Dark to your nocturnal activities. Thelma Howcroft said she was being watched by vampire hunters. Where are they hiding? I shouldn't. Investigate. Good evening. I'm Dr. Reed. Always a pleasure to meet a colleague, sir. Especially when he was supposedly dead. A colleague? Are you a doctor, too? Not anymore, sir. I used to be Dr. Rakesh Chadana. Now... I'm just Mr. Jadana, pawnbroker and humble guardian of this morgue. What do you mean, you used to be a doctor? Was your license revoked? No, sir. It is just that I like to be precise. I run a little pawn shop while taking care of the dead. But I used to be a real doctor. Are you afraid or uneasy being surrounded by so many corpses? Why should I? These bodies are empty vessels. Flesh left to decay. Poof. No soul anymore. All gone. An interesting point of view. And quite an exotic one, too. Most people fear, or at least have a respect, for dead flesh. Sir, as a medic during the war, I learned to face my death and the death of others. It's the pain we have to tame, not death. How did you get this job? After I left the army, I worked as an undertaker down by the docks. A dangerous place with many an unpleasant business there. Milton Hooks helped me get a job here. Have we met before? I don't think so, sir. Why? When we first talked, you said you were glad to meet me since I was reported dead. A funny story, sir. Your sister came here a few nights ago. You were missing, and she was looking for your body. She must be very relieved now. 
Do you work here alone? Yes, very easy work, sir. All I have to do is watch a few bodies. The situation was very different when the main morgue was still open. Why do you have to watch these bodies? Because these poor fellows have no names. We keep them in case someone comes looking for the missing. Sadly, very rarely happens. Why close the hospital's main morgue? It was for sanitary reasons after the beginning of the epidemic. Cadavers had to be moved to the nearest mass grave. A pawnbroker? I expect you get all types of people here. Yes, sir. All kind of people. For I sell all kind of goods. Who comes here to trade with you? It's very unhygienic, even unsafe. Diseases can spread. For the customers, for the hospital. I'm very cautious, sir. I've been a doctor, remember? And all my clients are good people. In fact, I think I only know good people. What kind of goods? With the quarantine, it's not always easy to buy things. So I trade, I exchange. Some people sell, some others buy. I like to help. Since you're not afraid of dying, do you believe in life after death, Rakesh? No. I believe we must do all the good we can while alive. For our time is short and the obstacles are endless. Do you think you would enjoy immortality as a concept? I don't think so. Don't mistake me. I love life and I'd like to live a long life. But everything has to decay, sir. Even goodwill. Do you really believe goodwill cannot last? As I said, sir, everything decays. If I was to never die, goodness, I would be bored or worse. And I like to be helpful, sir. Quite depressing, wouldn't you say? Yes, but the good news is We'll all die before losing our humanity, sir. So you're ready to die? No, I am not. I don't fear death, for I won't see it. What troubles me is the pain my death will inflict to those I know. You're a wise man, Mr. Chidana. No, Dr. Reed. I am a foolish man. But I like to think otherwise. Please show me what you have to sell. Of course. It's just trinkets and curios, really. But I'm sure they can be useful. It's locked, all right.
Good evening, Nurse Hawkins. Good evening, Dr. Reed. Pepper, are you sure you want to leave this hospital? To become a nurse was a little girl's dream. But in the end, I don't feel that useful. I want more. I want to make things change. You should be proud of what you've achieved. This hospital represents hope for many people in need of help. Maybe you're right. But at the moment, I feel like we're just a cemetery waiting room. What steps are you prepared to take to feel more useful? I don't know yet. My sister believes that the real fight is in the streets nowadays. Maybe she's right. Maybe this is what I must do. If you feel that saving lives is not useful enough, perhaps it means that you've lost faith. On the contrary, my faith has never been stronger. Maybe we are all just too proud to face up to the fact that science cannot compete with God. And what about Milton Hooks? Does he share your point of view? For Milton, any change means more comfort and more peace. I disagree. Goodbye, Nurse Hawkins. I understand you must be very angry about this unfair situation. I managed to arrange to have you buried in the same mass grave as your wife. I hope that might help. It's locked. You don't mind if I search your pockets? Do you, sir? You won't need any of these anyway. I'm not stealing from you, mister. I'm only redistributing your belongings to people who need them more than you. You see, no one has claimed your body, sir. So it would be such a shame to bury you with your valuables. I will not forget you, sir. And I thank you for your generous donation. Thank you. 
I cannot enter. This must be the place. It's definitely away from prying eyes. Relegated to the shadows. A kingdom of my own. At least I won't be sleeping in a coffin. The flower's dying. It needs water. William Bishop's blood is much more unstable than human blood and shows extensive mutation. But this is not what happened to me. I must keep on searching. The sun is about to rise. I can feel it. I'll continue tomorrow night. I have so much time now. If I'm to stay here until my research is complete, I'd better learn to hide my true nature from the mortals. But what about my thirst for blood?
Dr. Swansea asked me to correct you, Dr. Reed. Hurry up! I'm not one to make weight, Doctor. I've patients to attend. Yes, Nurse Crane? How can I help you? I'm so sorry. I know Dr. Swansea wanted you to rest, but we have somewhat of a crisis. A crisis, you say? Our supply of antiseptics is nearly depleted. I was hoping there was another box up here, but... What type of hospital are you running? No antiseptics? You have been away too long, Doctor. With the war and now this epidemic, supplies have been running scarce for months now. I may have a solution. In France, during the war, drugs shortage was a daily problem, and we had to use our wits to overcome the shortages. However do you mean? If combined correctly, certain household chemical products can be used in a pinch instead. Now, where's the hospital storeroom? The storeroom? Fat chance. This is the Pembroke, and space is luxury we don't have. Everything used to be stored in the old morgue. Perhaps I should look there first. Where is this morgue? It's the large building behind the hospital. You'll need to go in the back door because it's been sealed off for sanitary reasons. Take this key. It opens a small back entrance at the end of a narrow street. The abandoned morgue behind the hospital. A small door at the end of a narrow street. On my way then. Thank you, nurse. It's locked, all right.
It's locked. strain. This sickness moves faster than influenza. Fortifiers, <laughs> as popular as they are ineffective. But they do contain iron tartrate, and that might prove itself useful. This key will surely grant me access to the basement.
These scowls feed from corpses and the husks of animals. They're not after blood. Mr. Connor's injuries don't match the report. I'd better look into this. Traces of a pinkish foam at the corner of the lips. Some sort of drug overdose, perhaps? The chest was originally open to perform the operation. The sutures are clean, but the chest has been reopened. Multiple abrasions and scarring on the arms and legs. Old and distinctive injuries of a sailor or a fisherman. A puncture over the left lung, possibly a chest tube insertion. Not the cleanest work, but I think it was successful. Signs of internal bleeding. So, Dr. Tippett's anesthetics were incorrectly dosed, causing the patient's death. And then he tried to operate on him again. Tippett has made an egregious error. It's time we talked.
I'm not sure I can defeat them without becoming stronger. Oh, to drink blood is so tempting. Sodium hypochlorite. Dangerous to administer, but efficient in the proper dosage.
I'm quite busy right now, Dr. Reed. Thank you for your time. We'll talk later. Finally, you've returned, Doctor. Did you find anything of value? Yes, Nurse. You've worked your first miracle, Doctor. Now, this patient here needs immediate treatment. Duty calls? When the storm has passed, I'll show you how to mix the remedy yourself with the same basic ingredients. Many thanks, Doctor. When you've finished, you ought to report to Dr. Swansea in his office. He's been looking for you. Seemed pressing. It's locked, all right. Good evening, Mr. Fiddick. Good evening, Dr. Reed. Any news about my operation? Tell me about your injury, Harvey. Why do you feel so guilty about it? My wife died because of me. And now I may lose everything because I've been careless enough to hurt myself. What an arsehole. You can't hold yourself responsible for your injury, Mr. Fiddick. 
Unless you tried to hurt yourself. Of course I didn't hurt myself. But I can't work until my arm is fixed. My children need to eat, Doctor. How could your job be responsible for your wife's death? I was working a double. She went out to bring me a hot meal and got caught in a German bomb raid. Tell me more about the death of your wife, Harvey. 1915. I was in the army. Building workshops for the Royal Flying Corps. Helen was happy I wasn't sent to the front. What happened? The Germans sent Zeppelins to bomb the construction site, but they missed their target. My wife was bringing my dinner when the bombs fell. I'm sorry for your loss. So many died during the bombings. I served in France and witnessed the carnage there. I would like to say that she didn't suffer. Truth is, I have no idea. I just know that I'm all that me kids have. Poor little bleeders. How are your children after losing their mother? They were smaller then. The only good thing about this is my Ellen didn't bring them with her that night. Goodbye for now, Mr. Fiddick. I'll see you later. I will not let you down, my boy. Good evening, Mr. Goswick. How are you? I'm okay. Do you need any help? I'm afraid I may, sir. I don't mean to be a burden. You are not a burden, sir. Healing you is my responsibility. And you have my gratitude for that. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'll let you get some rest, then. Please, Jonathan, come in. Fascinating, is it not? In the last decade, so many mysteries have been brought to light with our microscopes. The human body, biology's penultimate frontier. The more we explore its boundaries, the less we're able to trace a clear line between life and death. You, my friend, have a foot in both countries. The view must be vertiginous. It's at least as vertiginous as chatting about vampires with you, I would say. This must be all so new to you. This area of town, the hospital, a brand new life. How stimulating it must be. I wish I could share your enthusiasm, Dr. Swansea. But my condition defies scientific categorization. Undead? Unalive? Immortality defies logic. I cannot express my thrill at this serendipitous turn of events. The world's most eminent specialist in blood transfusions, a vampire. One might say a gift from heaven. I'm a dead man. I was murdered. 
Now I'm a murderer. Tell me how this is a gift. Forgive me. I've been an admirer of your work for a long time, and now you are so much more than a brilliant physician. And please, call me Edgar. I'm not some doe-eyed student, Edgar. I understand we both have something to gain from this relationship. Very well. I have a task for you, Jonathan. Something that will require all your newfound skills. Please, go on. The Pembroke only survives through the generosity of our benefactors. Unfortunately, our main donor has found herself in a bit of a bind. Now, if you could help her out... A spokesman or politician is what you need. That's not my calling. And until I come to understand what has happened to me, I require discretion. Discretion is in order, Jonathan. Lady Ashbury has recently received rather indelicate correspondence that, if revealed, would jeopardize her position. And you would like me to eradicate this threat? By the stole, of course not. I would just like you to pay her a visit. Her ladyship is certainly near the tents outside, tending the sick. You can't miss her. Look for someone impossibly delicate. Accepted. I'll see what kind of trouble Lady Ashbury is in. <laughs> 